Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us for our online Sunday service. I hope that you guys are excited and ready to worship with us. Yes, get up on your feet, make a joyful noise, and worship with us. I hope you're also ready to hear an encouraging message from our very own Pastor Tyrone. It's going to be a blessing. But before we get into all that, here are a few short announcements. All those that are asking, what are some ways that I can give during this time? Well, guess what? There are five ways to give. In person, online, just visit www.tcc-nj.org backslash give. Click give online and once directed to PayPal, please follow the prompts. Also on our Venmo app, just search at tcc-nj. You can also text to give. Text the amount you would like to give to 855-935-4094 to get started or by mail. We shout your praise, oh God, and we make it glorious for your name is a great name, is a name above all names. So we shout it out today.
The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley.
Powerful grace. Powerful grace. Thank you, God.
And welcome back to another TCC Online. We are so grateful that you've chosen to join with us this morning. I do pray you were blessed by the praise and worship of TCC Worship. I pray everyone had a safe 4th of July. Pray you had a good time in your backyard or someone else's backyard, just kicking it and having some nice burgers and, and some healthy uh, spinach and things like that. Yeah, okay. Come on. I want you to turn now quickly to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're going to read a story that's actually found in the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The reason why they're called Synoptic Gospels is because many of the, uh, the stories are the same in each one of them, just taken from a different point of view, but uh, they're the same stories. And so this story is actually found in Matthew 19 and also in Luke 18, but we're going to read from Mark chapter 10. All right, I gave you enough time to find Mark 10. Now let's go down to verse 17. Here's how it reads. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad because he had great wealth. You know, ever since I was a kid, I think about this, that it's always been this pursuit for the fountain of youth. We're all looking. They've all been, always been looking for the fountain of youth because we all want to stay looking young, don't we? That's the truth. We moisturize our face. We do all types of things, buy all types of products. This is why in the middle of the night, if you're up late, you'll see all these commercials for these different things because we all want to be youthful. Well, they haven't found the fountain of youth because it doesn't exist. But there is something that does exist. And what does exist is what this man was looking for. This man was looking for eternal life. And so here he was now coming to the one who can give him eternal life. The sad thing is that this man could have had it, but he walked away from it. Today's title, if I, since I have to give it a title, the, today's title is this. Came rich, left poor. He came rich, but he left poor. 
You know, this young man, this man is called many times when you hear this message, he's called the rich young ruler. The reason why he's called the rich young ruler is because in Matthew chapter 19, he's known as the young man. And then in Luke chapter 18, he's known as a ruler. And in all three of the Gospels, he's known as someone who's wealthy. Ruler, ruler of what? Well, it's believed that he was a ruler of a synagogue. So he wasn't like a rabbi. It wasn't part of the Sanhedrin. Some say he is, but I don't know that that's true. But he was like a lay person, some type of leader within the synagogue. And so here you have this man who's around the things of God, knows the things of God, and he understood that one million years from now, I'm going to be someplace. And that's a reminder for you and for me that one million years from now, we will be someplace. Now, when I say we will be someplace, I'm not talking about the bodies that we have now. We all know that these bodies are decaying, hence we, why we're looking for the fountain of youth. But these bodies are decaying, and one day these bodies will die. But our spirits live forever. And so where will your spirit be? So this man, he wanted eternal life. He wanted life with God. When he talks about eternal life, what he's talking about is a life that's perpetual, a life that goes on and on and on. And he's talking about a life. And when he's talking about eternal life, this man is thinking about heaven. So I want to look at this man's life. I want to look at four things concerning his life, because I believe that his life represents so many lives of people that we know and possibly represents some of our lives. My prayer is that as we look at some of these things, that if we need to make some adjustments, that by the help of the Holy Spirit, those adjustments will be made. So come on, let's look at it together. So here are the four things that stand out to me in this story. Number one is the pursuit of the rich young ruler, the pursuit of the rich young ruler. Pursuit meaning him trying to obtain, trying to grasp, trying, trying to grasp, trying to get something. So the pursuit of the rich young ruler. Notice what he was trying to do here. He was trying to obtain, I'm sorry, he wanted eternal life. He said to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I want to pause right here now, and I want to just address the believers. Because see, for those who don't know the Lord, they're looking for eternal life. For those who know Jesus, how many know we already possess eternal life? We already have eternal life. Eternal life. We're not waiting until we die to have eternal life. No, we already possess eternal life because we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what the scripture says, okay? We're going to look at several verses today to just help us. In John chapter 3, verse 36, here's what it says. Whoever believes in the Son, notice, has eternal life. Not will have, but has eternal life. Present tense. It's John 6, 47. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. And John 11, you know, this famous passage of scripture dealing with um, uh, Lazarus, who's in the tomb, his two sisters, Mary and Martha, approached Jesus and said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, Jesus responds by saying this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, physically speaking. And whoever lives by believing in me, notice, will never die. Well, what is he saying there? He's saying that while we're here in this body, guess what? We're living for him now. We will never die. But he's not talking about a physical death. He's talking about spiritually speaking, that we will live forever. We will be with him. In John chapter 5, verse 24, here's what else it says. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Notice, we've crossed over from death to life. But again, if we're alive, we didn't die, physically speaking. No, he's talking about spiritually. Spiritually, we're all dead apart from Jesus Christ. Spiritually speaking, we're all dead apart from God, apart from his Holy Spirit making us alive. This is why it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, but God is so rich in mercy, and he had loved us so much that even though we were dead, because of our sins, spiritually dead, he's speaking about there. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So notice here now, okay? This is very important for us as believers. We're not waiting for eternal life. We already have eternal life. The life that we have in Christ, we have with him now while in this present age, on this, while we're alive on this side of eternity, and for all eternity, we will be with him. We have the life, the eternal life, because of our faith placed in Jesus Christ. And if that doesn't make you shout glory, I don't know what will, but that should encourage you today. And that life is also part of what Jesus says, that I've come that you might have life. Remember, now I've been saying this for the last few weeks. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly or in the New Living Translation, I've come that you might have a satisfying life. See, the life that he gives, the eternal life that he gives us is a satisfying life here on earth and when we die, we'll be with him for all eternity. Not these bodies, 
but our spirits will be with him for all eternity. So this man was in pursuit of eternal life. The problem is he was going about it the wrong way. What do I mean? Well, let's deal with number two. Number two is the pride of the rich young ruler, the pride of the rich young ruler. Notice his question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do? Not how can I obtain? No, it's like about works. Like there's got to be something I must do in order to receive this eternal life. There's got to be something that I'm, I can make it happen. See, that's his pride. His pride is I will make it happen. I imagine he amassed his fortune by, you know, doing what he needed to do. And maybe that's his mindset. I've amassed this fortune. I've become a leader. I've done it myself. So now I'll do this myself. I'll become uh, someone who has eternal life myself. Just tell me, what must I do, Jesus? And Jesus told him simply this. You know what to do. Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. And what were the commandments that Jesus told him? Because the man said in Matthew 19, 18, the man said, well, which ones? Jesus said, keep the commandments. And the man said, well, which ones do you want me to keep? And Jesus told him, hey, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie. Hey, don't covet, which means don't lust, right? These are part of the Ten Commandments. These are six of them. And honor your father and your mother. And notice what the, notice what the boy said in Mark chapter 10. Notice what he says here. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Then Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. I, I love this right here because, see, what's happening here is this. Jesus, the, the, Jesus is saying, these are the commandments you have to keep. And the, the boy is like, yeah, psh, I didn't commit adultery. No, I didn't murder anybody. No, I didn't steal. No, I didn't lie. No, I didn't covet. Yeah, I honor my mother and father. What you got, Jesus? What's, what's next? In other words, it's like a boast. And notice his pride. I've kept all these. Since I was a kid, I've been doing all of these. But Jesus just hit him with the whammy. Jesus burst his bubble and said, yeah, let me tell you something. There's one thing you lack. There's something that you're not doing. See, what Jesus was saying to him is, look, you have fallen short of God's glory. You, you may think that you're good. You may think that you're doing what is right. And, but let me just tell you something. You're still falling short of the glory of God. Here's what it says in John chapter 2. I'm sorry, James chapter 2, verse 10. Because this is important for someone that maybe you're, you're like this rich young ruler. And you know what? You have pride and you think, hey, I, I can earn my way into heaven. I can earn my way into eternal life. You know, all I got to do is, man, stop. Ladies, stop. Because let's take a note from this, this rich young ruler here. Jesus burst his bubble and said, no, you lack something, though. James chapter 2, verse 10, here's what it says. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. So notice, if you break one law, then you're guilty as if you've broken all the laws. See, that's very important for us to understand here today. Because some people will say, well, I've never done this and I've never done that. And they kind of boast about their good works. But you got to remember what the scripture teaches us, that there is none righteous. No, not one. There's no one who's so perfect that they earn their way into heaven. Nobody can stand before God and say, look what I've done. Because when you do that, you know what the scripture says? That God looks at our righteousness, right? Meaning our works, our quote unquote good deeds apart from him. He looks at them as if they're filthy rags. Now, I don't mean to be, you know, gross about this, but let's just give it what, what it means here. When it says filthy rags, it's talking about a woman's menstrual cloth, okay? That's what he says. He's saying, your righteousness, that's what it is to me. It's like a menstrual cloth. That's what he's saying. Your righteousness are like filthy rags. That's what the scripture teaches us. So no one can boast and stand before God and say, you know what? I should get in because, because nothing, there's nothing you do or I've done that could ever make Earn us, in, uh, earn us a ticket into heaven. No, that's not how it works, brothers and sisters. That's why the scripture is very clear that, you know what, we're in there. We get to heaven by grace and grace alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is, a, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Notice, no one can boast. No one who gets into heaven can say, I earned my way into heaven. No, we're all there but by the grace of God. As uh, the worship team finished singing, grace, wonderful grace, powerful grace. It's unmerited favor that he's given to you and given to me. Okay? And this man, what he missed out on was the fact that he was standing before the one who could give him eternal life. One thing you lack, the man, is what Jesus said to him. Jesus, in John 17, 3, in his priestly prayer, Jesus said this, now, this is eternal life. Remember that life that we talked about, that perpetual life, that life with God. 
This is eternal life, that they know you, meaning God the Father, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, the man missed it, because if he wanted eternal life, eternal life was right before him. Knowing Jesus is what brings about eternal life for you and eternal life for me. So now listen, so after keeping the six laws, you know, where, where did he fall short? Because Jesus said, one thing you lack. So we know he kept six of the laws, but where did the man fall short? Well, that leads us into number three, and that is the possessions of the rich young ruler. The possessions of the rich young ruler. All right, so Mark chapter 10, uh, look at verses 21 through 22. Notice, he said, Jesus said to him, go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, Follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, notice, because he had great wealth. Why? Because he had great wealth. So here's where he fall. This is where he fell short. So he dealt with, we dealt with the six laws, right? About honor your father and mother, don't steal, don't commit adultery, so on and so forth. But see, those six deal with our relationship with other people. Remember that Jesus said this, the commandments all hinge on these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the six that Jesus dealt with were the ones that deals in relation to people. And the young man could say, hey, I've kept those. I've not done any of those things. But now Jesus, again, hit him with the whammy. Because see, what Jesus did here is said, listen, come follow me. Sell everything. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. And at this, the young man went away sad. At this, the young man went away sad. So what, what was the deal with that? It's because of this. Remember the other four have no other gods, right? Don't use the Lord name, Lord's name in vain. Don't make any idols, all right? And then also keep the Sabbath holy. So we don't even have to get to the other two because just the first two alone have no other gods before me and no idols. Well, guess what? That young man, that rich young ruler could not release what? His wealth. And so therefore, his wealth took the place of God. Small g became small g, but it took the place of the big g in his life. See, he was unwilling to let go of the idol of wealth, the idol of possessions. And those possessions is not just money. Possessions could be anything. It could be a relationship. It could be a career. It could be, you know, a house. It could be whatever. Whatever the Lord is asking of you that you're unwilling to release is an idol. And you've made that a God. And at that point, it's where he, he fell sh short of the glory of God. And it's at that point where he made himself, he's no longer righteous. See, Jesus hit him with the whammy by saying, one thing you lack. And the one thing was this, his treasure was not with the Lord. His treasure was in his possessions. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, here's what it says. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So I wanted to read that because I want to make sure I'm clear to say it's not money that's evil. It's not having possessions that's evil. It's when the possessions have you. See, he had many possessions, but it wasn't so much that he had possessions. It was that his possessions had him. It's not. It's like in a relationship. It's not so much that you have a relationship. It's that the relationship has you. It's not so much that you have a job. It's that your job, your career has you, has you to the point where you're unwilling to release to the Lord what it is he's really after. And what is it that he's really after? Well, let me finish reading 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And notice, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So sorrow come because of people chasing after the wind, as it says in Ecclesiastes. But Matthew 6.21 is really what Jesus was after here. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Okay, let me read it one more time. Matthew 6, 21. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So you see, for this man, his treasure was not with the Lord. Even though he wanted eternal life, he wanted heaven, he wanted to be with God, that's not where his treasure was. His treasure was in his possessions because where your treasures are, that speaks about the value. What you value will get your attention. See, and what he valued was his possessions more than he valued God himself. Isn't that something around the things of God, in the lead of the synagogue most likely? But even that, his possessions, his position, you know, his lifestyle, he was unwilling to relinquish. Why? Because his treasure wasn't with God. That's not where his heart was. His heart was in the accolades that came to him probably. Like, yeah, there he is. He's rich. He's young. He's handsome. All the women probably wanted him. All the men wanted to be like him. And he was unwilling to let go of his lifestyle for what it is he was really looking for which was eternal life. So it's a very sad commentary when you think about it. Well, the bottom line is that Jesus was after his heart. 
And as I'm speaking right now, there may be people listening to me and you, you already put yourself in the place of that rich young ruler. You know what? He's not after your house. Jesus doesn't want you poor. Jesus doesn't want you suffering. That's not what he's after. The reason why he's asking for something is because he's after your heart. He wants to know, does your heart belong to me or does it not belong to me? Because if it belongs to me, then you'll give to me all that I'm asking you for. Now, let me get right to number four, because this is really what I want to just park for a moment here. OK, this guy, remember, he came rich, left poor. Why is that? Number four is this, the paradox of the rich young ruler, the paradox of the rich young ruler. OK, what do I mean by that? The contradictory statement that he made. Let's look at this. In Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, verse 18. Remember, he said, you know, teacher. He's a good teacher. And Jesus had to say to him, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Why do you call me good? See, why do I call it a paradox of the rich young ruler? Why do I call it a contradictory statement? Because remember what he said. And I want to make sure I just read this here, where he said, good teacher. Good teacher. You know what he's saying there? I believe in you, is what he's saying. You're good. Your character is flawless. Everything you're saying, man, I eat it up because I believe that what you're saying is from God. This is why he called him good teacher. And so Jesus asked him, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. See, Jesus was going after even before Jesus asked him for anything. Jesus was already challenging him, because if you really believe that I'm a good teacher and if you really believe that all that I speak about is the things of God and I'm coming to you with the words of God, then what I'm asking of you should not cause you to waver. What I'm asking of you should not cause you to clench up. What I'm asking of you should be something you should freely release, because if I'm asking you for it, then it means I have something better for you. See. Every good, it says in James chapter 1, verse 16, what, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father. So everything that we have that's good and perfect, the scripture says God and God alone gave that to us. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, here's what it says. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask of him? Why am I reading this? I'm reading these things because of this, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, because, again, if God is asking you for something, if you believe that God is good, how many times have you gone to churches or places or you just say to someone, God is good? What, what's the response? All the time and all the time. God is good. Well, if you believe and if I believe that God is so good, why is it so hard for us to give up what he's asking us to give to him? That's the question for us today. See, this guy, he came wanting something, believing that Jesus could give it to him. And Jesus was saying, listen, I can give it to you, but you got to give me something. Give me your heart. If you give me your heart, I can give you what it is you're looking for. You want eternal life? You want a life with God? You want to spend eternity with him? Then here's what you have to do. You have to give me your heart. There's no room for anything else. Anything that's not of me will not allow you entry in. What you have to do is you have to allow me full access to your heart. I need it all. Give it to me. Go sell what you have. Give it to the poor. And then notice it's not about selling and giving. Here was the part. Come and follow me. I wonder if the man thought to himself, wait a minute, hold up. This is the same Jesus who said, you know, birds have nests and, 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 and others have, you know, places to lay their head. But I have no place. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I, I wonder if that's what he was thinking about, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Like Jesus doesn't have money. See, I'm used to sleeping in a nice bed. I'm used to getting nice drinks. I'm used to getting a nice meal. What Jesus is doing, he's traveling from place to place and he really doesn't have any place to lay his head. I don't know if I'm signing up for that. See, and as a result of that, <laughs> The young man, the scripture says, when he heard Jesus said, come and follow me, he bowed his head and he walked away. Think about this for a second. When he first saw Jesus, he came excited. He came running. He knelt down. Oh, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus begins to explain to him what he needs to do. But when it didn't match up with what he thought it should be, he walked away. and He ended up losing out on everything that God possibly had for him. See, the problem was he walked away too soon. He came rich, but he left poor. You say, what do you mean, Tyrone, he left poor? Oh, yeah, he left poor. He, he left without the thing he came looking for, which was eternal life. But remember what we talked about on the front end of this message. Eternal life is not when I die and get to heaven. No, eternal life begins the moment I say yes to Jesus. And the moment I say yes to Jesus, now guess what happens? Yes, it rains on the just and the unjust. So that's the common grace that's given to any and everyone. But I'm talking about that special grace, that's grace that's given to his people. Oh, now I've stepped into a new realm the moment I say yes to him because he becomes my shepherd 
and I becomes his sheep. And what happens is his, his job, his responsibility to protect me, to provide for me, to give me an abundance. Oh, yes, that's what he would do for me. When I say abundance, I'm not talking about houses and land. I'm talking about an abundance of joy. I'm talking about an abundance of peace. And all of that comes when I surrender to him what it is he's asking for. So what relationship is he asking of you today? What, what career change is he asking of you today? Because maybe he understands that this career you're in is causing you to drift away from him, which is what we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Chasing after those papers is causing you to be away from him. Relationships, groups, whatever it may be. Come on, you fill in the blanks. You know what it is that he's dealing with you about. But today he's saying, hey, come and follow me. Not come to church. Coming to church is not following me. Follow me, meaning my word, obey my word, hear my voice and go where I tell you to go and do what it is I tell you to do. See, that young man left too soon because if he had just stuck around, he would have heard this. He would have heard the rest of what Jesus had to say, because when the disciples heard this, they were like, hold up. Wait a minute. Jesus is talking about, you know, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you keep reading down the passage. It's like a camel have to go through the eye of a needle using a hyperbole to hyperbole to to illustrate how difficult it is for someone who's holding on to possessions or holding on to people, how hard it is for them to get into the kingdom. Well, the disciples were like, wait a minute, then who can be saved? Because I imagine they're thinking, wait, we left businesses because remember, they had helpers. So they left businesses. They left it all. Some were tax collectors. And so they left a lucrative business to follow Jesus. So they're probably thinking, then who can be saved? And Jesus will go on to say this to them. And this is why the man left too soon. Here's what it says in verse 27. Jesus said, Jesus looked at them and said, with human beings, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. And then Peter spoke up and said, we left everything to follow you. And here's what Jesus said. Truly, I tell you, this is verse 29. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and don't miss this, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. See, what that man didn't realize is that if he had just released to Jesus what Jesus was asking for, Jesus would have given him above and beyond all he can think or even imagine. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear here. It doesn't mean like if you give Jesus $100, you're going to get back a million dollars. We're talking about a hundredfold or whatever, a thousand dollars. No, that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is this. I will give you everything you need in abundance, in abundance. And the thing that this young man was wrestling with was he was wrestling with the lack of peace in his soul because he realized, while I have all of these different things, what I don't have is assurance of eternal life. And eternal life was right in front of him. Jesus was right there. And all he had to do was submit and he would have received what it is he came running for. But instead, he came rich, had all the bling, but he left poor because he left empty. I don't know what happened with that young man. I pray at some point he said yes to Jesus. I pray at some point he gave his heart to Jesus. There's speculations about who this young man could be. I won't get into that. But the bottom line is that at that moment, he walked away poor. Because how many of us know when you have Jesus, you have everything? And see, and that's the question today. Is he enough? Is Jesus enough? And I want to say to you today, yes, he's more than enough. Because if you have him, you have all of heaven's resources also available to you. So today, don't forget now, yes, houses, lands, brothers, sisters. In other words, you're, you're in a family, but along with persecutions. Now, what I want to say about persecutions is this. Don't, don't trip over persecutions. Persecutions, that's good for us. Because like I said last week, it builds up our faith. We need some trials. We need the testing of our faith. It builds us up. It helps us to mature. But remember, in it, while we're going through it, he's there with us. He doesn't leave us alone. So today, come on, let's look at this life of this rich young ruler. And I want you to challenge your own life now today. Okay, so what, what is your pursuit? Is there pride in the way? Do possessions have you? Are you contradicting yourself by saying God is good, but not trusting him when he's asking you to give to him what it is that he's asking you to release to him? Because remember, what you give to him, he gives back to you in abundance. How many say amen to that? So come on, let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this story of this rich young ruler. I pray that when we all get to heaven, we'll see him there. I pray everything that he was pursuing, that he would have received, and that is that he's walking on streets of gold, and he's there in the presence of the Savior. 
There's so many lessons to learn from this, this young man, but today, Lord, for our purposes, Lord, we're reminded as believers that eternal life is found in you, and because we've said yes to you, we're not waiting for eternal life. We already have eternal life. What he was pursuing, we already have, and we're going to rest in that today that you're going to give us the satisfying life that we desire, Lord, the satisfying life that you desire for us, I should say, and that, God, we're going to be with you all for all eternity. It doesn't. We don't start being with you when we die. We're already with you. You're already with us. God, we pray, Lord, if there's an element of pride within us, Lord, that we feel like we have to do something to earn grace with you, Lord, then, Lord, deal with us like you dealt with this man. Show us for, show us for, for who we are, Lord. Like you used the law as a mirror to show him that he could not attain everything that the law required. The law showed him that he was helpless. The law showed him that sin's penalty was still waiting for him. Lord, do that for us, Lord. Remind us that it's by grace and grace alone that we're saved so that we will always draw back to you and rest in you. And God, I pray, Lord, that we won't hold on to things that you're saying let go of, whatever those possessions are. And most importantly, Lord, let us not contradict ourselves. When we say you're good, help us to trust you with everything you're asking of us. So we submit our hearts to your fresh, because that's what you're always after. We submit our hearts to your fresh today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. I pray you have a wonderful Sunday. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless. I hope you guys were blessed by the worship and challenged by the word of God. I'm just going to ask that you guys like, comment, and share this message with someone that you love. Also, let us know that you're watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be updated on all things TCC. Have a wonderful week and see you next Sunday.